Thank you very much. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, a very key issue in terms of the field of criminal justice, which is the, uh, the fit or lack thereof between the facts about crime and criminal justice and the public policy debate. And in my mind, there's, there's almost no area right now where there's a wider discrepancy than the, than the discussion about juvenile crime. Uh, in fact, in, in an analysis which I'm going to share with you, uh, essentially we found that uh, just about all of the popular assumptions and political assumptions about juvenile crime are almost 180 degrees off from what the facts would suggest. So we have a raging public policy debate which is transforming juvenile justice in this country, uh, rapidly leading to the demise of the juvenile court. Uh, and yet when you look at the facts and the assumptions driving that debate, uh, there's, there's a major gap there. So I want to go through some of this because if you only read the newspapers or if you only listened to the political discussion, you would get a very different idea of the nature of juvenile crime than, uh, than, uh, than what we have. Uh, let me start off by making a very key point, which should not be forgotten in this discussion, and that is that this country has an extraordinarily high crime rate. This compares uh, uh, victimization data. Can everybody see that? This is international comparisons on victimization data, Japan, Western Europe, and the United States for a variety of crimes. And you can see that uh, this country suffers from crime rates that are substantially higher than other Western countries. So everything I'm about to say is, is not to diminish the fact that this, we have an extremely high crime rate in this country uh, and, and way over uh, other countries. I mean, in fact, the only countries that even come close to us in crime rate are countries uh, that are often at war or have deep political crisis or, or really much greater divisions of wealth and, and poverty than the United States. Now, one of the assumptions that's been driving the national debate is that crime rates are suddenly up. If you watch TV, if you listen to the Congress, uh, you would conclude that crime is raging out of control. Well, here's national victimization data going back almost 20 years. And what it shows very clearly is not only isn't crime raging up, but it's actually going down somewhat. Violent crime rates, which would be here, excuse me, would be this one, I guess, household crimes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see it. That's why we're having trouble. There's a very thin line here, which is violent crime. And while it's gone up just a little bit in recent years, it's basically a straight line. You really can't see this on this projection. But generally speaking, property crimes are down, household crimes are down, violent crime is pretty constant. Uh, in fact, in 1992, uh, property crimes were lower than they ever were since we've started measuring them using victimization data. And uh, uh, the homicide rate in 1992 was almost exactly what it was 10 years ago. So overall, the crime problem has been pretty flat. It's not really going anyplace, even though the public perception is we're in the midst of a tremendous crime wave. Now, the other interesting issue is that juvenile crime rates are out of control. And this compares arrests per 100,000 population of persons 10 to 17. And what we're doing here is comparing the decade 70 to 80 with 80 to 90. And what you can see is that we've experienced a higher increase in juvenile crime in the 70s compared to the 80s even though, again, the perception is that juvenile crime is raging out of control. Uh, 
Here again, percentage of, of offenses known to the police that were cleared by an arrest of persons under the age 18. This is property crime, and this line, violent crime. Increasing slightly in recent years, but again, you can see that the, the number here is pretty much the same as it was here. There was a big dip. It's increased since this drop in the 80s. But if we went back 20 years ago, crimes cleared by arrest persons under age 18, not much different. Uh, now, another aspect of this, not, first of all, there's the, the image that juvenile crime is raging out of control. The data seems to suggest that it really isn't raging that much out of control. Uh, in fact, the overall share of crimes committed by persons under the age 18 has actually gone down, with, with one important exception, which I'll get to. Uh, this, using data from 1992, looks at the contribution of juveniles on a number of issues. Uh, juveniles comprise about 13% of the uh, of the population in 1992. What you can see is that they account for about 18% of violent arrests and 12.5% of offenses cleared by arrest. Now this is a very important distinction because uh, as Frank Zimmering at the University of California taught us several years ago, juveniles tend to commit crimes in groups and they tend to get arrested in groups. So there is an inflation of juvenile crime numbers because, for example, five kids might be picked up in a car, one of them pulled the trigger, those kids are picked up. That counts when you just count arrests as five arrests for homicide even though there may only be one person who was involved in the homicide. It could be that all of the five or some of the fives have their cases dismissed, discharged, what have you. But our arrest statistics are flawed because they're just measuring the numbers of persons taken into custody. Cleared by arrest is a different measure and gets closer to a crime in which the police actually believe they've solved it. And what's interesting is that if you look at violent crimes cleared by arrest, it's almost the same as the juvenile population. So the public perception, the media perception, is that violent crime is out of control and that juveniles are accounting for the vast majority of the violent crime out there. The fact of the matter is that adults are, account for the vast majority of the violent crime in the community. I mean, you are seven, eight times more likely to be raped, robbed, or murdered by an adult than by a kid. Yet the perception is we're afraid of kids and that we've, we've loaded the whole violent problem. Again, if you just turn on the evening news or you listen to the political discord, it sounds like the entire violence problem in this country is being driven by young people. In fact, young people, I would say according to this data, account for about as much violence as their size in the population. Uh, juveniles, for example, are much more likely to account for auto thefts, for burglaries, but when it comes to violent crime, violent is a is a an, a an older person's game. And and again, here's an example where the facts about crime and the and the perception is very very different. And and when facts and perception depart, and I'll get into this a little bit later, you end up with very bad policies. I heard a an, an NPR. National Public Radio interview with the, uh, the head of the Urban League in Miami. And he said in this interview, we have to face the fact that, quote, the black teenager is responsible for the entire violent crime wave sweeping this country. Well, that's not true, and it's dangerously not true, and it's kind of amazing that the head of the Urban League would be the person who holds this belief. And so when you have myths and they drive public policy, we start going in a very bad direction. Okay. 
what is up and what I think is, is driving the, the perceptions and the images is the issue of guns. This shows very clearly that uh, while the use of handguns in, uh, in homicides has gone up somewhat, the use of handguns in homicides by juveniles has gone up very dramatically. So this shows this dramatic increase in homicides by juveniles in which a handgun is involved. And if you look at this gun issue a little bit more, and what, what, it is, what is up undisputably are homicides involving persons under the age of 18. Here we see these 200%, 100% increases in the last five years. If you look at homicides involving kids under the age of 16, you have two and 300% increases. So it's this area of deadly force and, and homicide, which is up, which is getting the headlines and is driving the perception. And for you students of criminal justice, you know that compared to other violent crimes, homicide is relatively rare. Here's some more information which looks at the trends. Firearm homicide rates, ages 10 to 18, as you can see, they're up rather dramatically, particularly for African-American kids, which is the, the red line, dramatically although up for whites as well. And here's suicides, just to show you that this is also going in the wrong direction, <coughs> up fairly dramatically. So the conclusion I would draw from this is that, first and foremost, what we've got out there is a gun problem, far less a kid problem, but a gun problem. Uh, in fact, a number of research studies a major and very in-depth study by the blocks in Chicago and some other studies suggest that uh, the actual number of aggravated assaults and fights that kids get into hasn't changed very much. But what has changed is the, the lethal consequences, the lethality of these conflicts. So if you start putting handguns and in, the, in the hands of, of, of teenagers, uh, you're going to see more lethal consequences. So this turns the issue around. Uh, the public debate is, why do we have all these kids out there who are suddenly far more violent than they were before? And I think the data suggests that rather than a whole lot more kids that are more violent, and without spending a lot of time speculating as to why that's the case, what is the case is we have a whole lot more kids with guns in their hands. And the fact that we have more kids with guns in their hands is producing this death rate. So that to the extent that when we, we, we forge a policy which ignore, ignores the issue of guns and just decides to crack down on juvenile offenders, we have no chance of solving the problem. And, and I would say just parenthetically, we can get into this in the discussion period, we're not talking about kids walking into uh, Kmarts and buying hunting rifles. We're talking about the illegal trafficking in guns. Most kids get their guns off the back of a truck in the neighborhood from friends, from burglaries. They're not going to go into a store. So, so all of our gun regulations, all the gun laws, all the Brady bills are not going to affect this issue, at least not very much. Uh, the politicians talk about it, but it's not likely to do that. On the other hand, if you look at this nation's approach to law enforcement in illegal guns, you'll find out it's, 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 you know, it's been almost comic. We don't spend much money. The agency we ask to do it, ATF, is relatively inept. Uh, there's no plan. If you took most police chiefs in this state and you said to them, what is your strategy? Tell me your plan to stop the illegal trafficking of guns in your city. I think you'll get a lot of blank stares. This is not something that law enforcement community has thought much about. Not much money has gone into planning, execution, etc. So we have a kind of free market of illegal guns. And yeah, we'll pass Brady bills, and we'll pass assault weapon bans, and we'll have big debates about gun regulation, which might prevent somebody from going into a, a hunting store and buy a rifle, which you know is another issue. But it will not affect the issue of kids getting guns, uh, not very much, anyway. Um, again, I want to keep on pursuing this issue of how much violence is, is, 
is going on in this, in this juvenile population. This looks at 87, 89, the proportion of cases going through the juvenile court. And what you can see here is person crimes, which, by the way, includes simple assault, went from 16% to 19% of the juvenile court's caseload. Uh, what's also interesting is a huge drop in drug offenses. Property crime accounts for the overwhelming number of kids going through the juvenile court. So yes, there's a slight increase in person offenses going through the juvenile court, but not a big deal. I mean, in fact, if you look at this, juveniles 10 years ago accounted for about, oh, 17.2% of all arrests for violent crimes. And 10 years later, they accounted for 17.3% of all arrests, uh, about 2% increase. Uh, one of the things that's driving this phenomenon, I, I call the, the tyranny of, of, of small numbers. There used to be very few arrests of juveniles for, for homicide. Now there are relatively more. So uh, when you start off with a small number, it's easy to get a big percentage increase. You know, if I only have one, a case of one, and now I have three, I have a 300% increase. But really all I've got is two more than I had before. And so anytime you see a statistic or a discussion based on the percentage increase, you've got to figure out, is this a rare situation or is this a, a not so rare situation? By the way, before I leave this issue, uh, one, of, one of the interesting things I've, I found as part of this is that although we don't know for sure, we think that there's maybe about 2,500 people a year killed by kids. On the other hand, the best available data we have from on, on uh, child abuse and neglect suggests over 5,000 children who are killed by their parents and guardian. So 5,000 children killed by their parents and guardian, guardians and at most 2,500 people killed by teenagers. So in this national debate, we have to, know, we have to remember that kids are far more, far more likely to be the victims of violence, particularly by their own family members, than the victimizers. Uh, a child is more likely to be killed by his parent and guardian, twice more likely, than to be killed by another teenager. Now, these facts have not been in this debate and not been in this discussion, and they distort our law enforcement policies, they distort our prevention policies, uh, and what have you. Now, so big myth number one, juvenile crime is out of control. Juveniles are accounting for the whole violence problem. Uh, facts suggest it's not quite that simple. Second big myth driving the debate, the juvenile court is too lenient. Kids get off. Uh, they get a slap on the wrist. Uh, Juveniles are laughing at the system. Well, I don't want to go into this in, in all its detail, but I want to show you a couple of interesting facts. This is an analysis we put together which looked at a study of felony dispositions in 10 urban courts and compared it with felony dispositions uh, in juvenile courts in those same jurisdictions. And what we found is for every violent crime, you were more likely to be convicted. And of course, in the juvenile court, this is conviction is, I'm using the word in quotes, but the odds of being convicted more likely in juvenile court than adult court for every violent crime. Now, when you think of it, that makes sense. Don't have jury trials in juvenile court. These are summary pr proceedings by and large. Uh, kids have fewer rights. So it makes sense that you'd be more likely to be convicted of a crime in a, in a juvenile court than an adult court. And here's some data that is from California, but I can assure you that it is reflective of a number of jurisdictions. This shows you that for every violent crime in California, you will do more time in the California Youth Authority than you will in the Department of Prisons. 
for every violent crime, you will do more time in the California Youth Authority than in the prison system. So the assumption that somehow kids are getting off, getting lighter sentences, that if we just put them into the adult system, we're going to get tougher penalties is a myth. In fact, the most typical thing that happens to a kid who gets waived to the adult court is what? Probation. Now, this is not what the public thinks. When we pass laws making it easier to file cases in the adult court, prosecute kids as adults, what the public thinks they're getting is more prison time, more incarceration time. What usually is going on is the reverse. You're more likely to get less. In fact, in the classic illustration of this in Florida, a friend of mine runs a boot camp in Florida. And Florida has a law which says that if a inmate of a boot camp or inmate of a program hits a staff member, it's an automatic adult filed case. So what the kids have quickly figured out is that if you take a swing at a, at a, at a staff member, you get filed as an adult and put on probation. So if you don't like the boot camp, you hit, you hit a staff member and you get to go home. It's a, it's, you know, it doesn't take you long to figure out that it's, that it's a good deal. Uh, so again, it is a myth that, um, that the adult court system is, uh, is more punitive uh, than the adult uh, juvenile system. Now again, I just use California data. We've been looking at this at a number of jurisdictions and while I can't say it's the true, true in every state, and I won't say it's true in every county, it does increasingly appear true that kids are doing more time for the same offenses in the juvenile system than they would in the adult system. Uh, you take your garden variety juvenile case and you give it to an adult prosecutor, in most cases what they will do is dismiss it. It will seem so trivial and inconsequential that they will dismiss the cases. And with the exception of the extreme and bizarre cases on the high end, uh, the sort of capital murder cases, etc., with the exception of those cases, in general, juvenile cases are less serious. And if we truly had no juvenile court and just prosecuted all these kids as adults, we'd see far fewer kids in custody, far fewer uh, uh, convictions, and probably a lot more diversion and probation if we had no juvenile court at all. But again, the juvenile court is constantly being attacked for being too lenient. 75% of the public in every poll I've seen says the juvenile court is too lenient with serious offenders. So it is a mythology that we continue to carry. And in part, I think it's a mythology created by the secrecy surrounding juvenile court proceedings. The other related myth is, is that our correctional institutions are just filled with violent juveniles. That, you know, we need many more institutions. Your state is going to build a couple thousand juvenile facilities. Florida is talking about 800 new facilities. There's almost no state in America right now that isn't rushing to build more secure facilities for juvenile offenders. Well, let's take a look at who's locked up today. This is based on a national correctional reporting system that we do for the Department of Justice. And this looks at 1992 of approximately 50,000 admissions to state juvenile correctional facilities in all the states. And what we did was look at, divide those admissions up, this is individual level data, into uh, serious and violent offenders, which inter interestingly constituted only 14% of all the admissions to state training schools, state correctional systems in this country, juvenile systems, could be classified as serious and violent offenders. That is the 14% that almost all of us would agree should be in a long-term locked facility, 14%. The largest group, moderate severity. Now let me, if I can, read to you what fits into that category, if I can read it. Uh, small print. Here we're talking about uh, drug offenses, property offenses, public order, traffic offenses. So property, public order, like trespassing, uh, 
probation violations, these kinds of things. That represents the biggest category. These kids have one prior. These kids have no prior. So the vast majority of kids in state correctional facilities for juveniles in this country are property offenders, drug offenders, or less with no priors. So our juvenile correctional facilities are not filled with violent offenders. They're by and large filled with the group I just described. Um, and in fact, if you go around and visit these places, what you're going to find out is in many states, juvenile correctional facilities in effect serve as orphanages. These are kids that have no place to go. The child welfare system doesn't want them. The mental health system doesn't like them. As budgets shrink in other child, child caring systems, the juvenile justice system becomes the dumping ground. And so the kids that no one else wants end up in the juvenile correctional system. And so we put them in these facilities. So some of these kids are very serious offenders. And, and, and there's no question about that. But in the main, our juvenile facilities are filled up with, with property offenders, drug offenders, who don't necessarily have a, a long history of, of, of offending. What we do know for sure about them is that they're disproportionately minority kids. And this shows, I think, pretty graphically that the rate in custody per youth at risk for African American kids, 1,000 per 100,000, is almost five times that of whites, two and a half times that of Hispanics. So there's an extraordinary discrepancy based on race of who's in these institutions. And when you, we've done a number of analyses, and so has the Office of Juvenile Justice, and it's pretty consistent finding, which is when you control for all the factors that you think could account for this, offense severity, priors, even some of the family factors, race sticks out still as, as determining who gets locked up and how long they stay even when you control for everything else. So it's not just a function of these are the kids committing the more serious crimes. It's not a function of these are the kids with more priors. That accounts for some of it, but not all of it. Now let's look at these kids who are getting transferred to the adult court, because surely the kids who are transferred to the adult court must be the most violent kids. Here's a study by the Florida legislature. Florida waves more kids to the adult court than all the other states added up. They love to waive kids to the adult court. Texas is, is I think, fourth or fifth in this, in this category. And this study by Charles Frazier for the Florida legislature shows that of all these cases waived to the adult court, you can see only 23% of them for, were for violent crimes. Vast majority uh, a whole bunch of other kinds of crimes. In fact, if you look at juvenile court statistics, what you see is the biggest increase of transfer from the juvenile court to the adult court has been for drug offenses. So what we're getting tough over is kids uh, involved in drug offenses. Uh, it's not violence. Now one step further, which is we took a look at the kids based on a 1989 census of the persons under age 18 in prison. So who are these kids, per persons under age 18, who are in our state prison system? Surely they must be violent offenders. They must be murderers, killers, rapists, right? Well, 38% of them are, but 62% of the kids who are sitting in state prisons in this country are there for principally property offenses and drug offenses. So again, not only are our juvenile facilities not filled up with violent offenders, but our prisons who are housing kids are not primarily filled up with violent offenders. The typical juvenile residing in a state prison is a property offender or a drug offender. So again, myth that we've got all these terrible, dangerous kids and we're putting them in, in, um, in the prison system. Now, 
one of the related arguments is that we need to hold kids longer. You know, if only we could substantially increase the length of stay, we could have an impact on the juvenile crime problem. Uh, on average, kids stay about nine, ten months in, in state correctional facilities, uh, juvenile facilities uh, in this country. So if we could just kick up the length of stay, uh, we could make a big impact on crime. This is a chart produced by Delbert Elliott uh, based on the, uh, the National Youth Survey. And what this shows is the typical age at which uh, young people report their involvement in, 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 um, in serious violent crime. So this is self-report data. What's the age at which violent crime is reported? First of all, what you see here is that the peak year is about 16, 17, is, is, is when most people are saying they're engaging in serious violent crime. And one interesting lesson in that is Generally speaking, people don't get locked up till much later. And so, in fact, we're locking people up after their self-reported violent crime is going down very dramatically. And you can see this drops very dramatically. So, in fact, the longer we lock these kids up, the more we're locking them up during a period in which they probably would have stopped or slow down substantially anyway. So this is kind of like, uh, you know, giving a major multi-year contract to uh, Joe Montana. You know, I mean, Joe was a great quarterback in his day, but he's not likely to, uh, you know, have too many good seasons in front of him. And so if we want to start spending a lot of money uh, on Joe, or in this case, spending a lot of money locking these kids up, uh, we're not going to get much for our, our money. And the other implication, which I, I want to return to later, is if you look at this chart, it really suggests that prevention is the answer, that you want to get in front of that curve and, and, uh, and try, to, try to do something uh, before that. Now, um, maybe the, the, the sort of next major myth that's out there, and I just want to review it. Juvenile crime is out of control. Kids account for most violent crime. Wrong. Juvenile court is far too lenient. Wrong. That transferring kids to the prison system or through the adult court system will solve the problem. Wrong. The last myth, which I think is very pervasive and very dangerous, is that nothing works. You know, 1974, Bob Martinson and his colleagues did a very influential study in New York State looking at a lot of study, a lot of research on rehabilitation and reached the conclusion that they couldn't find consistent data that any particular correctional intervention worked. Uh, this study, which is a big and pretty boring volume that I'm sure you find in the library, was then popularized by Martinson uh, and really embraced by conservatives who, <clears throat> who wanted to get rid of rehabilitation and wanted to move to a more punitive strategy. Interestingly, it was also embraced by liberals who thought rehabilitation was infringing on people's rights. So you had this curious coalition of people on the right and people on the left. And one thing I've learned is when the right and the left agree, watch out. <laughs> not good, good things will not happen. Uh, and um, anyway, so Martinson published a very influential article in the conservative journal Public Interest, which says, which we asked the question, what works, and reached the conclusion, nothing works, which was then repeated and repeated. And even today, if you ask most reporters, if you ask most governors, if you ask most legislators, in their mind, the concept is there is nothing that works. Now, three years later, four years later, Martinson, in, a, in an article that no one's ever read, except me, I guess, in Hofstra Law Review, repudiates his findings and said, I was wrong. There's actually a bunch of things at work, and actually there was a methodological mistake in how we did it. Since that time, there have been a number of studies, very important studies, uh, by Mark Lipsy at Vanderbilt, uh, by Canadian researchers, 
uh, by Rand Corporation. And there is a consistent flow that comes out of this article is that there are lots of programs that work for serious offenders, juveniles and adults. Um, and, and so this argument that across the board nothing seems to work, the treatment and rehabilitation should be thrown away, is a false conclusion. And that there is a substantial and very rigorous body of knowledge indicating that there are a number of correctional interventions when you target them to the right kinds of offenders will produce reductions in recidivism rates. And, and, and so this mythology that there's nothing you can do that we just simply have to warehouse kids is a very powerful myth and one that I come on time and time again. We just finished an analysis for the Department of Justice on programs for serious and violent juvenile offenders. We came up with not a long list, <coughs> excuse me, but we came up with a substantial list of programs, good evaluation designs, reductions in, in, in recidivism rates compared to uh, to either control groups or matched groups, not miracle cures. We haven't come up with anything out there that's going to dramatically and in, in substantial ways reduce recidivism rates, but substantial reductions over what you'd expect for a number of programs um, and some promising leads, programs that at least, even if the research isn't 100% solid yet, is trending in the right direction. So here's another myth that's driving this public policy. There's nothing that works. Related to that is the assumption that prevention is just one big pork barrel, that prevention doesn't work, that there are no programs. I mean, this is akin to uh, that, the, that the great society, that the war on poverty failed. I mean, we've all heard that, right? The war on poverty failed. However, the facts are that the during the war on poverty, it was the greatest reduction in the, in the level of poverty in this country in American history, particularly am, am, among senior citizens. So, you know, we have to be careful of the political rhetoric because it's easily influenced by, by people who may be paying, playing fast and loose with the facts. And your job as students and researchers and people who are going to go out in this field is to make sure that policy is is as much as possible driven by facts and accurate information, not anecdotes and, and the kind of things that are created. So again, this powerful myth that there is no treatment, there are no prevention strategies that can work, and if you believe that, then you invest your money in locking people up. I call it the Hill Street Blues phenomenon. Uh, if you remember the show, TV show Hill Street Blues, uh, at the end of the show, somebody would despondently say, well, at least we got the slime balls off the street for a little bit. I mean, they didn't really think they could solve the problem, but the whole justice system was reduced to getting the slime balls off the street for a few days. Well, that's what our justice system is moving towards. You know, we're kind of, we've given up on treatment, we're giving up on rehabilitation. Uh, we don't really think locking people up does any good. I mean, most surveys of the public a minority of the public believes that prisons are going to solve the crime problem. But we're kind of, you know, we're down to that because we've sort of given up. And the give up strategy is again driven by this myth that we don't have anything that works out there. And, uh, and so, so again, when you add these things up, you come up with, with that. And I just want to throw one more piece of data into the pile, which is that somehow we've come to believe that there's no relationship between poverty and crime. And here's an analysis, again, Japan, Europe, Canada, the United States, looking at rates of child poverty, crime, and prison use. And uh, pretty convincing uh, argument here that uh, that there's a very close relationship between the amount of child poverty we have, the amount of crime we have, and the amount of prisons we use. It is not true that incarceration reduces the crime rate. In fact, incarceration appears to be positively related to crime rates. Not that prison causes crime, but certainly it sure doesn't seem to stop it. So, and, and this whole connection between poverty and crime has been lost in this country. One of my favorites 
I always, I always love is when someone says to me, well, that can't be because, you know, we didn't have any crime in this country during the Depression. You know, in the 1930s when, uh, you know, this country was in its depth, we didn't have any crime. And I said, gee, have you ever heard of Al Capone? Did you ever see the movie about the, uh, you know, Valentine's Day massacre? I mean, in fact, the homicide rate in, during the 30s was, was, was extremely high. And we didn't reach that rate of, of homicide in this country until well into the, well into the 1970s. So, but, but again, public policy driven by this myth, the good old days, when people were poor but honest, you know, when, when uh, being out of work and being desperate didn't translate into child abuse, homicides, etc. cetera. Uh, we have to be extremely careful of these myths, and I think we have to constantly push uh, elected officials on these issues. And I spent a lot of my time with elected officials trying to present this information and trying to pierce through this and answer their questions and try to, try to respond in some way to this, to this mythology. Where we're heading in this country in terms of juvenile crime, I think, is, is very dangerous. Uh, the juvenile court appears to be mostly dead. Uh, if it's breathing, it's, it's on life support in most places. This past year, according to the National Conference on State Legislatures, there were 700 pieces of legislation enacted in this country, all designed to make it easier to treat kids like adults, easier to, to have prosecutors make those decisions rather than judges, uh, lengthening incarceration stays. One of the new things that's going around the country is allowing juvenile correctional facilities to transfer kids to adult prisons just because they decide they're tough cases. And so we're seeing Minnesota, Georgia, uh, a number of places just administratively transferring kids from juvenile facilities to adult facilities with no due process and, and no real question of how those decisions are being made. So the juvenile court as we know it is just about dead and it's certainly, it's certainly uh, getting, uh, uh, getting worse and worse. And, and, and I'm, I'm sort of amazed by the, by the sort of uh, the, the hysteria that's driving this. Uh, in California, for example, we just passed a law uh, allowing 14-year-olds to be tried as adults for murder. And at the hearing, uh, the legislature legislators said, well, we're, we're pretty clear 14-year-olds should be tried as murder, but you know, maybe we need a commission to see whether or not 12 or 13-year-olds should be tried as adults for murders. And when I got up there, I sort of pointed at some of these folks and, who I knew, and I said, you know, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, you're a parent. If, if you have a, you've raised a 12-year-old. You know, if you can stand there and say that a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old that you've raised is a fully capable, knowledgeable adult, you know, you're either lying or you have a rare individual. I mean, kids who are 10, 12, 11, 13 uh, are not adults. Uh, research is very consistent. If you're under 15, you can't even fully understand the legal process. I mean, trying a, a person under the age of, of, of 16 as an adult is like trying someone in a foreign language without interpreters. I mean, it calls into question the whole legitimacy of the, of the court system. When you take a 12-year-old and you put him in an adult court, you give him a trial lawyer and say, okay, kid, instruct your lawyer as to your defense. Make decisions on how your lawyer is going to defend you. Uh, you don't need specialized attorneys. You don't need specialized judges. Uh, go ahead, 12-year-old, you know, participate in this legal process. I mean, just because kids do horrendous things, and we know they do horrendous things, doesn't mean they've become adults. You know, just because you have a baby when you're 13 doesn't make you an adult. But lots of kids have babies at their age 13. And, and so we're moving in this, this kind of idiotic direction in which we're sort of forgetting the basic facts about uh, child development. And we're acting as if these kids are, are adults. And then what we do, which I think is also interesting, is then we punk out. Because we pass these laws that want us to treat these very young children as adults, 
but then we don't really carry them out. In most states, Texas is an exception, in most states, kids who were prosecuted in the adult system stay in juvenile detention facilities. And in fact, they're overcrowding those facilities desperately. And when they get convicted, we put them in separate specialized facilities. We don't put them in adult prisons where they're going to be raped and where they're going to be beaten up and, and abused by older inmates because, you know, common sense prevails. And, you know, when we really look at that 12-year-old, you know, we, when we look at yummy Sandifer, who's 13 years old, and we look at him in the face, we say, we're not going to put this kid in Joliet prison. I mean, only a monster would do that. So, you know, we talk tough, but then we punk out. And then the net result is that the public gets more confused and more uh, alienated about this whole situation. Uh, again, the direction right now is all bad. 700 laws in the wrong direction. Uh, very few states moving in the right direction. Most people rushing to try to undo the juvenile court. Uh, and uh, certainly the juvenile court has its problems. And I'd be the first to admit those and say that the, the juvenile court's had its difficulties. But, you know, from my point of view, the concept that we could create a justice system that was caring and compassionate, that focused on the individual and try to come up with an appropriate strategy for that individual is a concept that we don't want to give up too quickly in this country. You know, Roscoe Pound, the probably America's most famous legal philosopher, said the American Juvenile Court was the most stunning step forward in, in Anglo-American law since the Magna Carta. That's a pretty bold statement. But when you think about it, a system that is caring and compassionate and focuses on individuals and tries to treat and rehabilitate rather than just based on revenge is a pretty remarkable system and we don't want to throw it away all that quick and we certainly don't want to throw it away on a bunch of myths uh, and yet this is the process we're kind of wrapped up in now now the uh, the media is certainly to blame and I've been spending a fair amount of time trying to educate the media on these problems. We've got to work with them. People who are in the research area cannot be, I mean, if all we do is talk to each other, we're, we're, you know, we're not really amounting to much in this world. You've got to translate your information to the media. You've got to be available to them. We've got to start putting information in forms that the media can understand. And in general, I think when they get the information, they want to use it. Uh, this analysis uh, of, of the myths and reality got a lot of press coverage because the media is always interested if somebody is willing to say, well, what everyone thinks turns out not to be true. You know, it's kind of the man bites dog phenomenon. The media always likes a story which is a little bit out of the ordinary. So if, if you can say juvenile crime really isn't up very much or at all, and everyone thinks juvenile crime is out of control, they're likely to want to build a story around that. So, so I think the media can be, can be won over in terms of the facts. And the other thing we've been trying to do is get the media out to visit good programs. That is to direct them towards the programs that work, the successful programs. On the theory that if they just go look at these things, they'll clearly know the difference between that and, and the kind of other other things that are going on. And, and, and slowly but surely, you can, I think you can move the media in that direction. Now, elected officials, I think, tougher, but I think, uh, again, reachable. Uh, some of the electoral process, in my experience, is, is really driven by issues that, that are rational, but they're not rational in terms of facts. They're more rational in terms of one political party trying to position itself against another political party. I mean, certainly Texas has seen that recently. I mean, you, you've had a governor uh, that expanded the prison system in this state uh, more than any state in American history, executed more people than any state in American history, and was declared by her opponent as soft on crime. So, I mean, when you, when you have that kind of political dynamic, which is not connected to, uh, to, the, to the reality, you have to keep that in mind, that politicians are not always going to respond to facts and figures uh, if there's a political agenda that drives them. Uh, so it's a tougher situation. Um, 
lately I've been thinking that we really have to spend less time talking to politicians who pretty much follow the crowd and really work on on the crowd. That is, I think the more important issue these days is to reach the public at large and to begin thinking about the organizations and structures in which the public can be reached. These could be churches. These can be PTA groups. Uh, these could be labor unions. I mean, I think you, you reach the public in a mass way through the media, but individually you reach them through organizations and associations that they belong to. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as, as criminologists, as people who want good public policy, to get our facts and information in the hands of people in ways they can use it and then, and then hope that that will translate into, into better public policy. Uh, again, I think the illustration here of this juvenile crime hysteria is an example of how hysteria can take over. Um, I'd like to draw the analogy, and I know most of you are too young to remember this, but in my life I remember the McCarthy period in which there was hysteria over communism. You know, we thought there was a communist, communist under every bed, a communist in every, you know, closet. And, and this paralyzed this country for years. And a lot of people lost jobs. A lot of people were, were, were harmed because of this irrational fear. And I think we're in the same situation now. This country is being driven by irrational fears about kids. Not that kids aren't of concern and we need to do things, but the level of fear is way over what it ought to be. And, and the irrational fear is driving very destructive policies and very expensive policies. And so if we just give in to this fear, we're going to end up really shooting ourselves in the foot. And the lesson I would draw from the McCarthy period, which I think is very important, is that you're going to hear a lot of people say, well, what we need to do is just simply appeal to this, you know, get tough rhetoric. You know, let's, let's make it seem like probation is tough. You know, let's pretend that the juvenile justice system is tough. You know, let's kind of recast in that rhetoric. Well, again, in the McCarthy period, there were a number of people who said, well, okay, we're going to try to pretend we're more anti-communist than McCarthy was. And so we're going to go and, you know, we're going to fire more people than he wants to fire. And it didn't work. Because the more the liberals try to act anti-communist, the more the McCarthy thing got fueled. And McCarthyism wasn't stopped in this country until a few people stood up and said, no, this is dangerous, this is wrong, this is irresponsible, this is distortion. And then it stopped. Uh, it's kind of like the old story we all learned as kids, the emperor had no clothes. You know, somebody's got to say in this hysteria over youth crime in this country, you know, the emperor has no clothes. There is not a juvenile crime wave in this country. There is a serious problem of guns getting in the hands of kids, which we need to deal with. But if we launch a war against children, which I fear we're involved in, we're not going to get any place. We're just going to have an angrier and more hostile generation. We're not going to have a safer uh, society. Uh, let me stop right there, and if you've got questions, uh, comments, I'd like to feel. Yeah. I see Texas as kind of an outlier, perhaps, uh, from the rest of the country in a variety of ways. Um, our, our juvenile crime rate, uh, victimization rates have been falling substantially where they've increased uh, in the rest of the country. Um, our poverty rate has gone up over the last 10 years. Um, we've been in the last with that. You talk about getting in front of the curve. Um, is that something that is a, um, a, something we can do within the criminal justice system? Or what, what does that plan way you suggested to move to get in front of that Well, let me give you an example of, of, of how I would look at that issue. We just did a, uh, we just took uh, FBI data and we looked at the age and, and race specific arrest rates for violent crime. And then we took those rates and we kind of did a projection or a forecast. And I know Steve Kuvalier is here is one of the people who does these kind of age-adjusted forecasts. 
And one of the things you see is that if nothing but demographics goes on, that is, if nothing happens in this country, if crime rates are just simply fixed at the 1992 levels, which is not the case, uh, we would expect to see a 20% increase in juvenile violence in this country in the next next 10 years. So just 20% increase over what it is, and it's certainly an unacceptable level. I mean, everything I have said about the rate not being out of control doesn't diminish the fact that juvenile crime is way too high in this country compared to certainly any other countries uh, in the world. But you can expect a 20% increase based on nothing happening. And if we experience the kind of trends that we've seen in the past, we could see the rate of juvenile violence double in the next 10 years. Um, and that's a pretty scary proposition. However, when you think about it, the teenagers who are going to be arrested for violent crime 10 years from now are three years old, four years old, five years old, six now. So we really could do something right away with three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-olds today. But this is not the clientele of the criminal justice system. I mean, my perspective is that the best thing that the criminal justice system could do is shrink. The best single thing we could do in this country is cut expenditures for law enforcement, corrections, and the courts, and shift that money over to prevention efforts. And the idea that we can expand the criminal justice system and we can expand the prevention system, I think, is a pipe dream. So I would say, as criminal justice practitioners, your, your job is to go out there and figure out how to cut, reduce or at least slow the growth. I, I often describe the criminal justice system in this country, particularly the correction system, as a resource-devouring monster. You know, Cal, uh, California is going to close its university system in five years to pay for three strikes and you're out. Let me repeat that. California will close the University of California and the state college system to pay for three strikes, you're out. If Texas continues on the path it started on, University of Texas will close, Probably this place will close down, or maybe it'll only be a training institute uh, for the correction system. You cannot have public education and a prison system the size of which we're building in this country. In Florida, Florida took $175 million from welfare to build new prisons. Now, you cannot pull $175 million away from the welfare system and not have an impact on poor kids and families and not have an impact on the future. So what we're doing in this country is we're building, we've built a monster, uh, what some of us call a correctional industrial complex, where the living is good, people are getting good salaries, a lot of money's being made building institutions, um, architects are living high on the hog, and that money is directly coming out of education at the primary grades, uh, social services for kids, and particularly higher education. And you know, when you cut higher education, you're cutting your economic future. You know, if you don't got universities and colleges, you don't got an economic future. Prisons don't represent an industrial base for a state. So, so I would say the best thing to do is put the emphasis on prevention. We know a lot about programs that work. We need to learn about more that can work. We need to try more things. But we know things like Head Start, family visitation programs, early interventions with at-risk families have good long-term consequences, and they're cheap. Uh, we did a study in Florida <coughs> showing that for each uh, inmate that they put in uh, what they call community control, which was 90 days incarceration followed by electronic monitoring in lieu of a year in prison, that for every inmate they did that for, they saved $5,000 per inmate, even taking into account, you know, non-prison-bound inmates who would go into those kind of programs. Anyway, when you think about $5,000, that's two kids in Head Start. <clears throat> that's four kids getting infant nutrition <coughs> programs. And the question is, you know, where do you want to spend our dollars? Do we want to spend our dollars locking up people after they've committed crimes or you want to, you know, want to put your money in prevention? And I frankly don't see a way out of it unless we substantially cut spending for the criminal justice system. And I think it can easily be done. Uh, uh, there's, there's pork. I mean, if there's ever a system where there is pork, it's the criminal justice system. And I can give you chapter and verse on that.
think that prevention does not belong under the you know, criminal justice profession? Because as a, I'm a probation officer and, and we have a whole bunch of money this year and we're getting more money next year, we have been implementing a lot of prevention programs. And I think that the uh, juvenile court system in coming, you know, I think we do have a lot more power than what we should probably. But we use that, I think, as well as prevention so that you get these silly little crimes and you put them on probation or an informal kind of deal and, and, it, and it keeps them from getting into bigger and better things. So both going into the schools and, and using a, a prevention, crime prevention, drug prevention program and then to taking the minor offenders. Um, do you think that prevention money should go elsewhere, maybe to the school or, or to other programs? Don't have a business doing that. Well, I, no, I wouldn't say you have no business. I mean, I, I think that police agencies, particularly those that are impl- implementing community policing, have a role. I think the court system and probation has a role. I don't think the role should be controlling it. Uh, if I was designing a prevention strategy for a community, I would be trying to establish within the community a collaborative group, which would include schools, police, mental health, social services, and I would want decisions made by that collaborative group. Uh, a lot of what we're doing now is, you know, very often what, what I see is that we, we waste a lot of money because the criminal justice system tries to create what should probably exist in the community. You know, for example, we create day treatment programs, which basically are schools. Why? Because the schools don't want to handle these kids. Okay. We provide uh, uh, drug treatment and counseling. Why? Because the kids we deal with don't have access to drug treatment and counseling in the community. Uh, I've often said aftercare services, which is a buzzword. But aftercare probably doesn't even need to exist if we had the right kind of community services for kids. You wouldn't need to have aftercare. Kids would be able to naturally access services out there. So I think we want to be careful as professionals in the criminal justice system to sort of build our own little programs, usually out of frustration. I mean, I'm not saying we're evil people for doing this. We got these kids. We know they have needs. So we try to create these programs for these kids because we're frustrated because those people across town won't deal with this. You know, we know our kid needs family preservation services, but we can't get them in family preservation services. So as a probation officer, I'm going to start becoming a family preservation worker. But that's really a mistake because all we're doing then is replicating and expanding and duplicating, and we're not confronting those agencies. I mean, setting up an alternative schools because the schools don't want to deal with kids, I think is a big mistake. A better use of energy is to demand that the schools educate all kids. And if I can set up an alternative school, for tough kids, then so can the schools. Maybe I'll have to show them how to do it, but it's really their responsibility. I mean, we've got things now, I mean, the AMI program, which is all over Texas, accesses education funds and basically has a second school system for kids who should be in the, in the regular school system. So I think the prevention, prevention's got to be community-wide, uh, should not be controlled by the criminal justice system. Uh, there's nothing about the criminal justice system that equips it to be a deliverer of prevention services. And one of the things we're increasingly seeing is that, uh, you know, it's, it's the same families and kids that are being accessed by welfare, mental health, special ed, criminal justice system. You know, from the point of view of some of these families, it is dizzying how many caseworkers you have. How many media, I mean, any of you would probably go nuts if you had to see as many therapists, counselors, supervisors as some of these families have to see. And we're surprised when they don't show up at some of their you know, meetings. <clears throat> and one of the things that I've discovered in city after city is that all these helpers and counselors and supervisors aren't even aware of one another. You know, there isn't a common case plan for this kid or, even, or this family. Seven different people are going into that household doing seven different things without any knowledge of what else is going on. And that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes sense if you want to protect your agency turfs and budgets, but it doesn't make sense in terms of saving money and and delivering 
services. I mean, I, I still reach the conclusion that in most instances we are spending enough money. We're probably spending too much money in some areas. So it isn't a matter of just, oh, if we only had more money, we could do the job better. I think very often we're just, you know, we're just using the money in very inefficient and wasteful ways. Yeah. Mr. Chair, it says on gun and illegal obtaining of guns. Uh, are you suggesting that we locally take on guns like we have drugs? Well, yeah, I've, I mean, I, frankly, I think if we took the entire drug budget, about $28 billion, I would rather, which has produced almost nothing. I mean, the national drug strategy has been a, an abysmal failure. More drugs available today than when we started. More kids using drugs today than when we started. Price of drugs is cheap today as when we started. So, I mean, I, I would like to, anyone to tell me one fact that's better having spent $100 billion on the drug war than before that. But I think that money probably could better be spent on a gun war. Uh, the problem is you're going to you know, upset the NRA. And uh, people don't want to you know, fight that battle. I mean, I would be the last to say I'm an expert in how you would launch such a war, but I got to believe that we got some intelligent, very resourceful people in law enforcement that if they had the money and, and, and the go-ahead to do it, could figure out how to make a dent on illegal trafficking of guns. It's a lot easier, in my naive view, to crack down on gun trafficking than on trying to, you know, uh, stop powdered cocaine from flowing around across borders, etc. I mean, we know where, who is making these guns. You know, this, this is not coming from, you know, the, uh, the plains of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, Colombia here. We're talking about we know who makes the guns. <laughs> we know who ships the guns. It's pretty clear where these things, you know, are coming from. And, and I think it would be, a, a, in some ways, a similar problem. One of the I issues I see is that our strategy so far has been to crack down on kids with guns. You know, and I'm not against that. I mean, I think you have to establish certain very clear standards, like you can't bring guns to school. So I'm not for, you know, being soft on people with guns. But, but again, that's not going to solve the problem. As long as people are going to make money selling guns to kids, there's going to be guns in the hands of kids. Uh, part of the problem we've been going into is that, again, you know, what we've gotten into in this country is is kind of, uh, what I would describe as wholesale justice, not retail justice. You know, instead of looking at an individual case and figuring out that case, we now want broad categories. So now every kid with a gun in school, automatic expulsion. Well, that includes from the dangerous gangbanger to a kid who brought in a gun that doesn't even work because he wanted to impress his girlfriend. Should they get the same penalty? Should their lives be impacted in the same way? I don't think so. I don't think any kind of concept of justice that I know would argue that you ought to treat those cases the same way. But we're kind of moving in that direction. You know, cross the board, wholesale. Uh, I don't really care what the issue is. Many of the kids who are in adult facilities, for example, are there for this interesting crime called selling drugs within a thousand yards of a schoolyard. You know, mandatory incarceration, mandatory transfer. Now the same transfer, you know, sale of marijuana five feet further gets you probation. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I mean, we've, we've reached a point where we, we've got a justice system which is totally illogical and, and I think people are beginning to sense that. that and and it, 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 it undermines the justice system. So it doesn't increase public confidence, it really decreases public confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Leslie Wilkins was fond of saying that, that crime and, and criminals and criminal justice involves issues in which the facts don't really matter. And, and so I guess particularly the strength with which people hold views on crime and criminal justice. And, and, he, and he used to question whether or not the public was indeed educable on, on matters involving crime and justice. And I, I wonder, I mean, I share your view that, that, uh, that we as scholars and academics and researchers have an obligation to make the facts known uh, to the public and to policymakers, that kind of thing. But how do we break out of this, this view, in your, in, as you see it, 
that, that government is the solution to the crime problem. We have the daily messages coming out of Washington since November 8th that tell us that government is not the solution to our problem, to our problems. In fact, government is a problem. And, and everybody is suddenly excited about this notion of getting government out of our lives, except in criminal justice. In criminal justice, we're seeing the nationalization of corrections, for example. $30 billion being made available from the federal treasury and the states to build more prisons. The federal government taking a much more active role in, in uh, dictating the nation's style of policing, community policing grants. And so while on the one hand we're trying to get the government out of our lives, in every other sphere except for criminal justice, we continue to see the government as the solution here, passing the laws, the hiring of more criminal justice personnel, and so forth. How do we break out of this mindset? Well, so it's, it's, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good question, and it's a tough issue. I think uh, part of, I think, what we're seeing is, uh, is the complicity of the criminal justice professionals themselves in this. You know, it's give us the money and we'll solve the problem for you. All right, you're giving us the money. The problem hasn't gotten worse. It must be those folks over there that are screwing up. So the cops blame the prosecutors. The prosecutors blame the judges and the correctional people. So you keep on passing the blame, you know, down the road. But give us more money. I mean, I'm always impressed whenever there's a story, every year there's a story about how the crime rate went up or down. If it goes down, the police take credit for it. If it goes up, nobody seems to, you know, no one seems to know why crime went up. It must be because of drugs and gangs. But if it went down, it must be because of, uh, you know, the police. So, you know, I think the criminal justice system is lied to the, to the public consistently and, and, and basically lied to get more resources and more prestige. Uh, and I think if we have any people in the criminal justice system with, you know, with any kind of professional ethics, they ought to stand up and tell the truth. Some police chiefs are standing up and saying the police cannot solve the problem. There are some police chiefs who say 100,000 police officers, not going to do any good. Uh, I mean, the whole community policing movement is a strategy which says that we do not need more police and that more police are not going to solve the crime problem. We need different kinds of policing. Uh, so I think that's part of it. You know, I think we have to, criminal justice professionals have got to stop lying to the public about what they think they can do and not do. Uh, on this issue of wanting to delegate to government this problem, I think that's, that's a real toughie. Uh, but I, see, I'm not so sure it's an isolated phenomenon. Because after all, I guess I look at it as, you know, we've delegated to, to the legal system a lot of problems. You know, you have this explosion in tort law, and you have much more litigation. I mean, this is a society which, which if something bad happens, you sue somebody. So I think it's part of a broader cultural dependence upon the legal system, which is unique to this country and has grown in this country <clears throat> and you don't see it at, at, in other places around the world nearly to the same extent. It is a contradiction to have people who are against the growth of the federal government pushing for a huge expansion of federal authority. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. But again, I come back to you know the kind of psychology of this. When we were involved in the Cold War, people were willing to spend almost anything on the Cold War, whether or not it made any sense, whether or not it could be demonstrated that it would do any good. People were willing, because of their irrational fear, uh, to give the Pentagon just about anything it, it, it needed. Um, and I think at the moment, this fear level is there, although if you look at long-term data on crime fear, you know, it rises and falls. So, I mean, we may be peaking I hope we're peaking on this uh, <coughs> phenomenon. And, and uh, uh, the data I've always looked at suggests that crime becomes the number one issue when employment isn't. So we happen to be at a point in this society where unemployment is down, the economy is going pretty well, people are mostly worried. You know, they have the luxury of worrying about other things than, than, than their jobs. You have a severe economic downturn and crime goes off the... The map. You know, the other thing here is is that, which I've been real interested in, and is a, something I've been calling the globalization of tragedy. I mean, there really is a new phenomenon that has been generated because of the mass media technology. 
Uh, I'll give you an example of this. Um, how many of you have heard of polyclass? Yeah, most of you, I bet, have. The young girl who was kidnapped and murdered in Petaluma, California. Well, 10, 15 years ago, I don't even think the polyclass case would have made the San Francisco newspaper. I mean, and if it did, it would have been page 25 in the back, girl kidnapped from home in Petaluma. Nowadays, we have a technology produced by the you know, CNN and these other satellite hookups so that the polyclass tragedy is experienced not just in Petaluma, California, but worldwide. And not only do we know about it, but we can listen to the victims. You know, we, we knew Polyclass's father and grandfather. We can personally experience that tragedy. And I think the net effect of that is that every day in this country, some terrible thing happens, and the media brings this terrible thing to us front and center. So here you're living in Huntsville, Texas, and every day you turn on the evening news, and it's Polyclass today, and it's Yummy Sandiford tomorrow, and it's another tragedy, and two kids in in London the next day. And in terms of your psychological response to this, you think the world is falling apart. And in fact, there's lots of surveys now that the typical American believes the world is, you know, is falling apart. Well, in fact, what you've got is this compression of all these things that are going on across this, across big, this country, big country now being now compressed, compressed into, the, into consciousness the consciousness of the average, of the average citizen, citizen turns, on turns on the TV. The TV. <clears throat> and again, not only hears about it, but also gets a chance to sort of wallow in the sorrow of, this, uh, of these tragedies. Uh, so a few events, very few events, can suddenly be fueled into uh, a sort of major outcome. In the, in the California situation, the media kept on talking about four crimes in which a very young teenager had committed a terrible murder. And I was interested, so I went to the Department of Justice to try to find out how many similar crimes had occurred in California. And what I discovered was it was just those four. So in this state with 30 million people, there had been four crimes involving teenagers who had committed very heinous murders. Uh, but when the media told that story over and over and over again, you kept on hearing these four stories, it sounded like 4,000 stories. So I think we're... You know, we're kind of trapped by our own technology here. We now have this, this sense of, uh, of kind of doom because something happened in a housing project in Chicago. Now, just because, you know, a, a teenager dropped another teenager out of a 10-story housing project in Chicago, I mean, that's a terrible tragedy, but it shouldn't really affect the consciousness of people in this town, but it does because they know all about it. And I think... I think we're, we, you know, in a way, this irrationality has gotten worse <coughs> because of that. And I think, you know, as a result, it's going to be a tougher, you know, tougher situation. Uh, the media seems willing, I think, and open to information. The toughest nut to crack is television. I mean, the television people are convinced that blood and guts sells TV time. And so it's very hard to get the local television people uh, to report, uh, it's pretty pretty easy to get the newspapers to start doing good good reporting, uh, but it's tougher and tougher to get the television folks. There's almost an aesthetic. What do they say? If it bleeds, it leads. That's the you know the, and and so there is this distortion. But we've been spending quite a bit of time talking with people in the television, you know, the local TV news producers to try to sensitize them to the damage it does when you when you do this. Northwestern University did a study showing that 17 out of the 20 minutes of local news in, in Chicago local TV stations was devoted to crime. I mean, when you think about it, you know, crime does not account for 17 out of 20 minutes or that, you know, that percentage of life. <laughs> and there are a lot of other things that people care about, you know, education, health care, uh, what's going to happen to their elderly parents, uh, their jobs. But when the, when the local media is willing to dominate news coverage with crime, it does, it does frighten people. 
and make them very scared and, and very concerned. And uh, go ahead. I have a question that um, most of the time I'm really depressed about these things. And I, at the same time, if I think back even five to ten years ago, we were in the middle of a drug war, and every politician running for anything was willing to pee in a bottle to prove uh, it was it was the thing. Everybody talked about it. Now we sort of gotten sick of drugs, and the media don't pay nearly as much attention to drugs as they did five years ago. My hunch is that five years from now we will have another politicalized issue, something other than chewing out time. We're, we can do a lot of, and we will do a lot of damage in the next five years to the to the system. But five years from now, my hunch is this is going to be off the news and something else, whatever it is. It could be unemployment. It could be um, it could be a major earthquake that that then makes us concerned about um, physical safety in that sense. What is so, all? I guess my question is, do you see anything, any hope that people will simply OD on, <laughs> on this issue? Or maybe OJ on this issue. <laughs> uh, well, I think so. I mean, I, 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 you know, if you go back historically and you look at this, these issues, there is a lot of flux. I guess that's my first observation. I think the drug war collapsed because it became too expensive. You know, everybody went bonkers out there to do this, but then the cops realized, you know, it was costing a lot of overtime and they weren't getting a lot of money. I mean, they got forfeiture money, but basically it cost too much money. And it wasn't getting any place. So I think it was kind of, it collapsed of its own weight because it couldn't be afforded. And... uh Although a lot of people went to prison. I mean, the huge increase in prison population, it had a major consequence. But uh, you're right, the drug war is over. Florida, you know, Florida used to, in the height of the drug war, 45,000 admissions to Florida prisons last year down to 25,000. Pretty dramatic in terms of prison admissions, and almost all of it accounted for by drug offenses. And I think we'll see a diminution of the drug uh, phenomenon, although I think if you go back to the, you know, if you think about the drug war, there was a period in which every single night on the nightly news, you saw police with their, you know, those cute little blazers with the eight-inch letters saying police, you know, breaking in to buildings and arresting, in the main, minor drug dealers. Uh, you know, and I used to say that the drug war was made for TV. I mean, it allowed white middle-class Americans to kind of look at this underside of society in a very safe kind of way. And it had a drama, it had costumes, it had everything to it. Uh, so, I mean, it had a certain visual appeal to it. Uh, but, I, but I also think the drug war was driven by a fear that, that the, the middle class, particularly middle class white kids were using drugs too. And I think when that issue shifted and the public began to see drugs as largely an inner city minority problem, it lost its political force. Uh, I recently met with Lee Brown, the drug czar, who's very concerned about how you bring drug policy back into public awareness. And you know, my advice to him is you've got to broaden the discussion to alcohol because you know, if you start talking about alcohol, then most of us whose kids are going to college know that our kid is more likely to get into trouble by drinking too much than by taking drugs. I might be more inclined to buy into a, to a drug control strategy than, than if I'm just thinking, well, that's those people across town, and, and I don't have to worry about them. Uh, the violence issue may, may taper off, although uh, I think it will taper off. I mean, something else will kick it off the, you know, the evening news. I think the problem with what we're doing with violence, however, though, is we're, we're creating this time bomb effect because by tremendously increasing penalties for offenders, <clears throat> we're doing things which have no short-term impact but have long-term impact. You know, let me give you a quick equation. If you, if let's say rapists in the state of Texas serve seven years, and then we decide to double the amount of time that rapists serve, you will not experience that increased cost until year eight. 
So we've got an interesting new equation, which is when we get tough on already violent offenders, which is what the, you know, these are people who are already caught and we're just going to punish them longer, you don't pay the bills till down the road. The drug war costs immediately. The crackdown on violence, since we're not catching any more violent people, is going to be a bill that will be paid down the road. So a governor could plausibly say, okay, I'm going to be tough on crime, but I won't have to pay the bill. I'll be gone by the time somebody's going to have to worry about this. So it's a little bit different just in terms of the economics of it. Yeah. What do you think about uh, laws like New Jersey's, which says that a sex offender when he's released from prison has to be identified, the, the neighbors and 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 the you know, as I was thinking about it, I guess I don't have any strong objections to those laws because I think all they're doing is creating an urban society what used to exist in small towns. You know, if, if you lived in a small town and somebody, you know, everybody knows what everybody did and does and would do, so I'm, I'm not sure it creates any, you know, if it leads to vigilantism, if it leads to other kind of problems, I might be concerned. But I don't see anything per se wrong with it. And I... I don't buy the argument that just because you've served your prison time, you know, you then can be completely, you know, anonymous in terms of that. You know, I, I would certainly hope that when, uh, you know, when uh, the white collar criminals come out of prison, you know, Michael Milken or Boski, we don't forget what they did to us. So, you know, so I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, that's such a, it's not going to do anything. I mean, I think part of the problem is we're, we're hung up on symbolism spend a lot of time debating the death death penalty. So what? Whether we do it or we don't do it won't make any difference on violent crime in this country. Uh, Megan's Law. You know, we, we just seem to always gravitate towards these fascinating little symbolic conversations that are largely irrelevant because uh, we don't want to ever get to the, you know, the issues that really might make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Just immediately as you said that, the so what question kind of tug at me. And I wonder if part of our problem is our unwillingness to get beyond all of the things that we're talking about today and start talking about our attitude toward people of color, our attitude toward people who are desperately in cultural poverty. Because that's where I see the issue, really, that we're, we're unwilling to address. We want to still pretend that the problem is juvenile violence or drugs. My concern is that as we, as we lose interest in juvenile violence, what we're going to do is better identify a way to target people of color who are poor, because that's what the drug war was originally about. And then it suddenly found out the drugs were a problem in our middle class communities as well. So now we're worried about violent juvenile crime, and we're unwilling to accept that what we're really trying to do is to, in Spencer's word, continue this separation of people and that socially explosive group of people that Dynamite talks about are increasingly being excluded rather than included in our society. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a very good observation. I guess I'd respond in two ways. Number one, for anybody who's ever taken sort of a basic course in sociology, uh, one of the things we know is that societies are not held together by cops and prisons. You know, Soviet Union and South Africa were held together by cops and prisons for a period of time in a fairly unsatisfactory way. Lots of violence, lots of problems, and they blew apart. So, I mean, you can't construct a society and think you can keep it together with prisons and cops. Anybody who thinks they can do that is, you know, I mean, that's crazy. Uh, so that's the first, you know, sort of lesson in this, that if we have deep social divisions and problems that lead to violence, to think that you can just some, simply build prisons around it or hire enough police officers to, to keep that problem from coming into my neighborhood is, is, is pretty naive, although a lot of people believe that. But the other thing is, you know, I think one of the reasons we, we, we spend so much money on prisons is that that's pretty, it's an easy thing to do. I mean, there is nothing easier for a politician but to spend money on the building of a prison. You know, money goes in the hands of your political contributors. You get to hire more state employees. 
you know, it's a win-win situation. Some rural community that's having a hard time gets an industry. So building prisons is a real simple. I mean, we know how to do it. It's not very hard. The designs are straightforward. It is a, it is a simple thing to do. Dealing with the number of, you know, the 90% dropout rate in an urban, of males in, in urban school districts is a hard thing to do. So, you know, we're kind of stuck with these really hard problems and then these real easy problems. And, and the, you know, I think the gang phenomenon is a similar thing. I was watching the CBS News thing uh, that I was mentioning is to Ruth, which CBS News, Mobile, Alabama, story about how the Chicago disciples are taking over Mobile and, you know, recruiting all the kids. I mean, this was pure fantasy. I mean, yeah, there are kids in Mobile who call themselves disciples and they know how to you know, draw pitchforks on the wall. But the idea that the Chicago Disciples, if anybody knows them, would be capable of running something, you know, in Mobile, Alabama, I mean, is almost ridiculous. You know, these are kids who can hardly, you know, get up in the morning and, you know, and, and, and go where they're supposed to go, much less run a, you know, a criminal syndicate 2,000 miles away. But for the people of Mobile, that's a convenient explanation. You know, if our problems are being created by this evil empire in Chicago that's coming in here and invading our turf, then we don't have to worry about what's going on with our own kids. We can attribute the problem to some external force which isn't about us. And I think a lot of the problems we see in violence, particularly in violence, is that it exposes us to an ugliness that we don't want to look at. I mean, we don't want to look at the number of kids who were abused and neglected in this country. You know, we haven't even scratched the surface. And because we don't want to deal with child abuse, we don't want to deal with family violence, we don't want to address those issues. Uh, you know, it, we're looking for any excuse, you know, anything to get us to not look at the tough problems. And again, you know, okay, so we won't reduce child abuse in this community. Well, let's build another 10 prisons. That'll be popular. That'll get me votes. Uh, I'll never forget a conversation I had with uh, uh, John Ehrlichman, who was the chief of domestic policy for President Nixon. I met him in a federal prison in, in, in Arizona where he was serving time for the, his Watergate. Uh, and I asked him, you know, one question I was curious about was when they discussed crime in the White House, what were those discussions like? And he said, you know, it was real curious because whenever we discuss crime, after about a half an hour, we'd all start getting a headache, you know, because nobody really could come up with any, you know, anything that made any sense or could work. So we'd talk about it till we got a headache, and then we'd, we'd say, okay, let's talk about something else, <laughs> you know, that we might be able to do something about. And I think, you know, that's the, what makes these issues so hard is, is you're talking about issues that go to the very fabric of this society. And, and so it's pretty easy to come forward with the magic bullets, you know, used to be scared straight, then it was tough love, now it's boot camps, tomorrow it'll be something else. I mean, if, if I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic that the American public is so hooked on hope. I mean, they're so willing to buy the latest claim that something might work, that if we could get information to them on what does work, <laughs> you know, we could, we could leverage that optimism. In, into some kind of positive program. So, I mean, for me, the priority is to identify programs that are successful and package that and get that information in the hands of the public on the belief that if the public understands that the last chance ranch is better than prison, then they'll want last chance ranches. They won't want prisons. Uh, and and, and my, my sense is that that's been the reaction, that when you put something in front of the citizenry that makes sense, they, you know, they, they will tend to move towards that as opposed to, to the, the kind of things we do which, you know, which, which make no sense. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to know what, what you think the reason is that Florida waves so many juveniles to the bill for And you said you're going to stay with Florida, which more than the rest of the country. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what are you going to bring? Well, 
Florida went to a to a system of of, uh, of what they call direct file, which is prosecutorial control of it. So where most jurisdictions, this is changing, but it used to be that to get a kid into the adult court, you had to go through a hearing in the juvenile court, basically on the fitness of that kid for being handled in the juvenile court as opposed to the adult court. So you had a deliberative process um, with rules of evidence. In effect, we made it hard to do that. Florida created a direct file arrangement in which prosecutors could just decide for certain categories of offenders to do this. So it became real easy to do it. And in fact, the Florida system is, uh, they call it a blended system. What can happen in Florida is that you can be prosecuted as an adult and then put in a juvenile program. So again, I think it plays into the politics of it. There's a crime, there's a lot of notoriety associated with the crime. Prosecutor, in order to get some political mileage, says, I'm going to try this kid as an adult. Adult trial, kid gets probation. Public never hears about the probation. What they hear about is, the, is, is that. By the way, well, just a thought that occurred to me. One of the things that I've, I've felt is that the debate in this country, I think, has been, has been, has been distorted by the, the political nature of prosecution. I mean, prosecutors have become political partisans. Very often you go from being a prosecutor to being and elected officials, a lot of our governors, our president, a lot of our senators, our former attorney generals. And so there's a connection between prosecution and politics, which I think is, is, is harmful. I, I've advocated we at least think about a military system in which you know, the defense and the prosecution rotate, and that you don't have career prosecutors and career defense attorneys, but you have career lawyers who play on both sides of the aisle, and that somehow we could take the political nature out of the prosecution process. I mean, I think we'd see a, uh, we'd see a much better system if, if, we, uh, if you didn't have one group that really is heavily motivated by political interest in, in, this, in this situation. But I think that's mainly what's going on in, in Florida right now, which is, which is uh, this explosion of direct filing, which, by the way, is going on now in many other states that have now enabled prosecutors to do the same thing. So, okay. <laughs>